Hello. Hello there. Morning. Did you get a good enough sleep? Uh, no. no. Okay. Uh, this is Bishek. I'm Miro. Uh, we work at Red Hat. Uh, we also are members of FESCO. And uh, we also have some strong opinions about modularity. And I think you know that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Uh, this talk is called Alternatives to Modularity. Uh, we are not uh, here to give our opinions to you and then go home and everybody will be happy. This has an hour and a half and we expect everybody to discuss after what we say. Uh, if you have a need to throw things at us, uh, uh, please do, it's fine. The thing we say about modularity is that it brings us a lot of benefits and uh, we recognize them and we see them. We are not like fanatics. And uh, people say that we have the too fast, too slow problem and the modularity helps to solve it. Uh, people say it helps to solve independent life cycles. It provides us multiple versions of RPM with parallel availability, not parallel installability. Uh, it also brings us non-supported RPMs and build root only RPMs. So you can build your stuff with stuff you don't ship to your customers, which makes perfect sense in some scenarios. And it also gives you easy rebuilding of, uh, for multiple federal releases or releases of anything, uh, easy chain rebuilds and installation profiles. Possibly it also gives you more, but those are the things we identified as what people who know modularity think modularity is about. Uh, but if we want to go like more official, there is this objective, Fedora objective. This is why we all do this in Fedora. And it says that modularity will transform the all-in-one Fedora OS into an operating system plus a module repository, which will contain a wide selection of software easily maintained by packagers. And we would like to achieve the goal without the stuff we have now, without the modularity stuff. So in order to do that, we first need to remove the modularity words from this goal, which leaves, we transform the all-in-one Fedora OS into an operating system, which will contain a wide selection of software easily maintained by packages. Oh, wait. We've been doing this since day one. Uh, are we good at it? We don't know, we try to be. Is it getting any easier to maintain the packages? Sometimes, sometimes it's getting less easy or even harder. But we try to make this happen. And suddenly a lot of, a lot of things go out. Uh, Spishek will tell you what actually modularity is on the technical level. Because when we ask what modularity is, we usually just say about the requirements and the features. But it actually is something. All right, so um, when we, I mean, it's, it's a big, thing that contains of many, many parts. And uh, I think it's, it is good to, uh, to, to consider them one by one. So the most obvious part is the module ML language that defines modules. And this is what, would, what uh, packagers would interact with. Uh, and then there's the server side infrastructure that we have uh, to have to take the, those definitions and, and use them, uh, and uh, those two parts are the uh, like big complicated uh, things that, that have to be written and have to be uh, maintained and so on. Uh, once we build stuff, we deliver it to users, and uh, this, uh, this is something that is visible to users, this is something that requires uh, additional uh, support uh, in the uh, infrastructure, uh, and uh, we also need to adapt pretty much everything that uh, Fedora is. So Koji needs to know about modules, uh, Body needs to know about new type of updates, DNF well, has uh, lots of requirements are put on DNF, it must understand modules, it must report conflicts, it must report uh, modular conflicts and package conflicts and so on. Uh, in Pajor, we have a new namespace. Uh, well, Pungi also needs to understand modules to build, build the um, delivery stuff. Uh, mirror, this must be mirrored. This must be maintained by Relang. Uh, 
in federal release, uh, this, uh, there was a plan to uh, define the base version, so even federal release is impacted. And uh, on top of those changes in the tools, uh, we need to update policies. We need to create new uh, update policies and um, teach our developers how to follow them. We need to teach developers how to uh, do things in this new scheme. And in the end, uh, users also need to learn this new stuff. Right? These modules are not transparent and they cannot be transparent because the, the way that the packages are uh, chosen for installation and upgrades is, is changed, so, so even users would need to learn uh, those new things. And um, so, uh, <coughs> so, so the, right, we, we don't want to rant. We, we want to uh, talk about solutions which build incrementally on the stuff we already have, uh, and um, as far as possible, those solutions, when they are localized uh, in the sense of impacting just some parts of this uh, long list of things which I listed here, uh, are easier to, to both to our developers and to our users, uh, and uh, they're also probably easier to develop. Mm. Yeah, so in order to talk about this, we think it's important to actually look at the modules we have in Fedora. Uh, because a lot of people don't know what modules we even have. Uh, unfortunately, it's non-trivial to figure out. Uh, but it's an implementation problem, not a design problem. And this is what you have in Rawhide when you do DNF modules list. And we split it into several categories. Can I have the clicker back? Thank you. Um, so we have a lot of modules that have one stream, one package. When we say one package, sometimes it's two or three, so we are lying, uh, but they are interlinked very hardly with dependencies and they basically behave like one package. Uh, some of them are uh, alternate versions to what we have in non-modular repositories. Some of them are the same versions of what we have in non-modular repositories. Some of them are only available through this one stream, one package module. We also have a lot of multiple streams, one package modules, uh, so you have different versions of MariaDB, different versions of Avocado. You can even have different versions of uh, subversion for some use cases. Uh, there is this uh, dep 3 slash Java kind of modules. So uh, for those of you who don't, are not familiar with these, uh, they basically include all the Java dependency tree of the thing they are called after, except Java itself. And they try to like, have everything for themselves which is a good uh, argument from a maintainer perspective, but technically there has been a lot of issues with, the, with conflicts with non-modular con uh, content and stuff like that. Uh, and there is uh, one uh, thing that's different and that's Perl module, which is a language stack. The, the difference is that it doesn't include dependencies of Perl and then Perl as the final product. It contains Perl and a lot of Perl modules as like the ecosystem, and you can then switch different versions of Perl, including the packages that have been you know, like built on top of that. Uh, it's special because only Perl is doing it, but you can do it with other languages as well. We are just not currently doing it. And there is one module, Perl Bootstrap. We just assume this is something they use to build the Perl module. But uh, yeah, thanks, so that's true. So if we go back to the goals, uh, the, the list of things like do fast, do slow, and stuff like that. Uh, and we try to propose some alternatives. And the first thing is do fast, do slow problem. Obviously, this is a meta problem because we try to achieve solving it through the independent life cycles and multiple versions of software. So we can just go there. But uh, uh, there are some important things to consider here. Uh, there was another talk here at DEF CONF. Uh, this is different slide uh, taken from that talk. Uh, and it has an interesting observation uh, which I would understand as, as the following. In order to want something to be fast, I need to be deeply involved or interested in that very thing. Uh, and that makes me a different kind of user of that thing. Uh, a specific example is Python. So as a Python developer, I care about the new Python version. I wait for it, I need to support it with my library, I, uh, I need to test it, I, or I need the new features to actually start using them. 
But on the other hand, I am the Python developer, and uh, I know how to handle Python all using the tools that Python provides. So all I need is the interpreter, and I'm fine. I don't need DNF to run on this new Python version. I don't care as long as DNF works. And DNF is just an example of something that's written in Python and important for me. Uh, on the other hand, if I am not a Python developer at all, I am not very interested in the new Python version that much that I would need to do something specific other than just wait for the next release. Uh, so there is no particular need for, in this very example, to have, I don't know, different versions of DNF built on different versions of Python through some stream expansion, which is something that might be useful for DNF developers, but they can like run their tests of DNF without any RPMs. The independent life, life cycles is one of the things we want to use to solve the too fast, too slow problem. Right, and uh, I mean, the idea, the idea sounds great in principle. We, we have built new versions and we deliver them to users and users pick when they, when they want to have the new version. Uh, but in practice, uh, well, this might work for leaf packages, uh, but it doesn't work for uh, packages that interact with other packages. And it doesn't even really work for, uh, uh, for stuff, I mean, again, this is like the previous slide. If this is the stuff that I deeply care about, I'm fine with the new version. But if, if this is just some part of the OS, I don't want uh, to come to my desktop one day and see a new version of GNOME running if it's uh, much different. Uh, so in Fedora, uh, we, we, this, this, uh, this problem has been, uh, well, uh, seen forever and we have a very specific set of rules and guidelines. Uh, you are not supposed to do uh, software version bumps when this software changes in any significant way at any time. You can only do it at release boundary. And uh, I mean, this, 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 this is the thing that allows us to uh, coordinate changes in the distro. This is the thing that allows users to have some stability and know when, when they will get a new system with possibly uh, annoying or in incompatible changes that are, that are significant. And uh, if something is delivered as a stream as part of the distro, the same rules need to apply. And in fact, this has been discussed and voted uh, by FESCO, and uh, you cannot obsolete streams at any point in time. You cannot um, do significant version bumps at any time. You must coordinate with, with, the, with the releases of Fedora. Uh, and so this is, this is those packages that interact with other packages. But then we have the special case of uh, stuff that could be made to, uh, is either backwards compatible or uh, the user could opt in into having a rolling stream and, and version updates at different time. And uh, in fact, we already do this, right? I mean, we, the policy discourages it for, for good reasons. But in the, those cases where it makes sense, we do it. So Firefox is essentially a rolling package uh, for two reasons. One is that it m tries to maintain backwards compatibility. And second, uh, it's a very big project that releases often and backporting any significant number of patches to older version is just not feasible. And uh, it's better to have users see new Firefox packages uh, even in stable releases. And the same is the, true for the kernel, um, some antivirus software, possibly some other packages. Uh, and uh, if we want to have a package that is uh, um, rolling, we, we can achieve this already in, in our current system. If, if, we, if I have Node.js and I want to have a, uh, I mean, I need new updates, if Node.js rolling a, comp a compact package or a second package was built, users could have access to, to the rolling stream or the rolling version of the package. Uh, this is just a question of policy and, and naming, but we can, technically we can do this. Um. So when we say alternate versions of packages, uh, like new versions, older versions, rolling streams or whatever, it, this has been brought multiple times on the mailing list. People repeat this. We have compact packages. And the arguments against compact packages, and for those of you who don't know what that means, there will be an explanation in the next slide. 
uh, is that people are often afraid of them. They are annoying to create. I wanted to say to maintain, but at the end, once you have them, the maintaining is the same as any other package. They are annoying to create. And people say they are hard to discover. So it's hard to say what Node.js versions are there in Fedora from the user perspective if some of them are in compact packages and some of them are in normal packages. So a compact package is a package that has something, usually its version or a version of some stack uh, in the name of the package. Uh, this is from the guidelines. Uh, uh, we needed to put some fancy stuff, so here's a regular expression. Uh, but uh, there are some examples. So you put the number 0 0.5 in the package name. Uh, so you can have the Python SQL Alchemy package in a different Python SQL Alchemy package that have different names and they don't collide. You don't need to put a number in there. You can put a feature stuff like stable or rolling or different kind of malloc or whatever. What's important, and people often forget it, is that there is no package review required when you introduce a compact package. So there are no roadblocks. If you have, uh, uh, if you have a, I don't know, Python 37 package and you want to introduce Python 38 package, boom, you just run the request repo, dash dash, I have an exception. There is nobody who would actually check if you have it. They just create the repo for you. Uh, but if you follow the rules, you can do this. Uh, the good stuff about the compact packages is that they may or may not be co-installable. So for example, usually what happens is if you have a, a compact package for OpenSSL, then uh, which has the SO numbered file dif with different number, the runtime packages can be installed together while the devil packages conflict with each other. Or you have different uh, setup tools built for uh, Python 2, Python 3 this, and Python 3 something else. Uh, if they are called different, they install to different locations and everything is fine. They don't conflict. Uh, but you can get conflicts and uh, when we go back to the goals, the goal was to have this parallelly available, not parallelly installable. So conflicts are fine as long if they are explicit, as long as DNF tells you, hey, you can't have this pedal and this pedal at the same time, you have to choose, then we are still getting there where we want it to be, while on the other hand, we have a benefit of using the same mechanism for stuff that actually can be co-installable, like the Python packages, for example. While within modules, even if this is technically possible, as long as you put it in the same module, different streams, you just can't. Uh, there is this discoverability problem, so uh, yes, you can list all the packages. You can do DNF list v8 and it gives you all. This is cheating because if you try to do this with Python, you also get all the Python packages, not just the Python interpreters. So this, yeah, like you can discover the packages, but it's not uh, very nice. Uh, and we get back to that. Uh, the problem with uh, compact packages, one of them I told about is that people don't want to create them. It's hard. And, uh, or hard, tedious, let's say that. And uh, we want to make this easier. There are a lot of people who try to make uh, packaging easier through various macros and dark rituals and stuff like that. We put in Fedora, so we have this automatic generation of build requirements and stuff, and it get, we are getting there. It's getting easier and easier. So for example, you can have something like this. This is a Node.js package that has a conditional macro in its name, and, uh, and then you have the Babel package, which is an oldest package. I think somebody just said, like, is this software collections or something like that? Uh, we get to that. Uh, the idea here is that you define or not define the mod version thing, and I use mod for the lack of better term, like module in, in this case, but it can be anything. And uh, when you define this macro in the build root, you get a different build artifact, uh, which is called differently. Otherwise, you maintain the same spec file uh, in possibly in one place or in two places, if, if not possible. Right, so, so this is a mechanism to build both the compact and the non-compact package from the same source. Yes. Uh, what's important when we do stuff uh, is to make sure that the RPM automatic provides and dependencies uh, actually encode the, the, the version this is for. Uh, so for example, in Python, you can have uh, Python 3.0 setup tools as a provide or Python 3.8 setup tools. 
and we now provide both. But we make sure we require the, the more specific one on, on runtime. Uh, and this is easy because then the, the conflict happens soon. It will tell you, I, I need the specific version of Python of, for, for this library. Uh, while if, if there is something like, I just need the Python free version of setup tools, and it will try to get the other Python free version because we can have multiple, uh, the, the resolving might end up somewhere totally differently, and then the error for the user might be very, very hard to understand. But even that is possible. Uh, this is uh, good because you can have co conflicts when necessary uh, versus dependency held by design, uh, which is like, uh, this has been excluded. Okay. Uh, you, you should never get a message that says this has been excluded, but you didn't exclude anything. Well, here you get this can't be installed together, which is kind of better, but not, not the best. Uh, this looks a lot of like software collections because you need to put the special macros in the names and requires everywhere. But what's important is that you don't move the files to OPT. You don't need to activate this. It just happens to be there. And if you can install it together, good. If you can't install it together, also good. Not that good, but also good. In the discoverability problem, uh, this is what we currently have with, with the module implementation in DNF. Uh, so you list modules and it will tell you, yeah, uh, so Node.js, you know Node.js, we have this and we have that, and you can, you can pick. This is actually very nice, thank you. Uh, we, we would lose this with compiled packages. Because uh, if you have a package that's called Node.js and a package that's called Node.js 10, uh, DNF doesn't know that this is like the same package with a different version because we tricked it into thinking it's a different package by renaming the package in the first place. But we could solve this quite easily by using virtual provides. So, so, the, so there was a question. We, we, we have this idea that we will go through our slides and then we will return and please keep the question. We want, we want to encourage discussion, but we were like, if we allow people to discuss after everything we say, we might never get to the end. <laughs> uh, so we will Try to be quick, get to the end, and then go back through the slides and encourage some, some questions like that. Uh, so if, if Node.js then provides something like alternate Node.js, this is just a crazy idea, and the naming is hard and blah, 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 uh, then we can have a tool that will find all the versions, alternate versions of this package and give it to you. It can either be implemented in DNF or somewhere completely different. If we like, think DNF is, has already enough work to do, we can implement a separate tool. Uh, an idea, you would list alternatives or whatever, and it would just uh, give you the, the package, Node.js, and all the other packages that provide the alternate Node.js. Uh, this should be a, an easy task to do, but we admit that it's not there. So, um, for unrelated reasons, people have been uh, have been working on something that is very useful for uh, this, this subject. Uh, that is uh, uh, build roots, right? Uh, so we want, to, um, we want to test packages that are, when, they're, when they're built in Rawhide, and we want to uh, gate them. We want to uh, admit them to the Rawhide repo uh, only if they pass some, some set of tests. And for a while, we had this for single packages. But we didn't have this for the case of uh, multiple packages that co-depend uh, on each other and need to be built, rebuilt uh, together, and then only this resulting set can be tested. And to do this, uh, we uh, implemented something that is uh, called site tags. So you you you, you make a, a, a well, you, you send a simple request and a separate build route is created for you. Um, and uh, we, we had this, this idea for a long time, but it was always manual. It was done through a, a ticket in the Relang uh, bug tracker, and uh, some human had to go and click some buttons to, to, to make this happen. Now, this is automated. And uh, this gives us this beautiful ability to, to build packages uh, like we do with streams uh, in this custom environment that we can possibly uh, well, make uh, different, for example, by installing some specific versions of packages, some macros, whatever. Uh, and 
this, uh, this is a slide for Igor, who is not here because his, his kid is sick. Uh, so uh, I think we should just skip that. I mean, the, the important part is that we, we request a site tag. We have some uh, scripting that is particular to Rust packages that understands the Rust metadata. This scripting spits out a, a, a list of packages that need to be built in a specific order. And then we just tell the uh, uh, tell fed package to, to build those packages in this custom build route. Uh, and once this is all done, we create a body update. So this, this already works. Uh, the availability of, of site tags as, as a uh, general thing was announced a few days ago. Uh, what's important to say that this looks complicated and we can't just say have every packager write scripts like this because that's a step back and we realize that. We just try to show that we have the low level tools to achieve the goal and then we can build something on top of it. And it's also uh, very good to realize that the people who actually need to build stacks in particular order, uh, the number of people who need to do this is very limited. There are packages, uh, I see some of them here, who have to do this regularly. But if you look at the contributor base of Fedora and, and the number of packages we have, most of the community contributors don't need to ever do this. And we shouldn't like spend all our energy on the use cases of the few. Uh, we think we should rather spend our energy on the use cases of the many. Uh, and I don't mean users, I mean contributors in this case. Uh, but this allows every uh, experienced packager to hack around, like create something that works for them, and then maybe gradually we can make it a multiple press level tool, but we don't have to. Yeah. Um, I don't know what's next slide, so I don't know who will be talking. Yeah, I, I, can, I can say that. Uh, so uh, this allows us uh, do you create a source RPM macros binary package, either as a sub package of some of our interpreter or something, or even a standalone package? Create some macro definition that defines the mod version macro or something like that. Build that into the build root and tell the build root to install this by default, uh, and then build the dependent packages on top of it. It still requires a manual step, which is tedious, but it's technically possible. Uh, and if there is a way to even like tell Koji to build a package with a particular macro set to a different value, you can even avoid this step, which I know Koji knows how to do. I'm not, just not sure whether it's possible from the outside or you need to be an admin to do something like that. So when MBS builds something and wants to change the macros, it uh, installs the macro files in the build root. It doesn't just tell Koji set this macro, right? Okay, so uh, just to have it on mic, MBS does this internally for you at the very same way basically, but it's, uh, you don't have to deal with this. Thanks. What's next? Uh, I could say that. Uh, one thing that, uh, that people have been using, uh, especially in some of the Java, Java modules, uh, is uh, private build dependencies. And, and some, uh, I think it was David Control who called it bundling. And I quite agree that this is bundling, but much worse. Uh, and it's perfectly sane in enterprise to say, yeah, so in order to ship this software, we need this software, but the other software is hard to maintain and we don't want to sell that to customers or give them support or whatever. So we will like protect them from this unmaintained software. Uh, while in a good, healthy community project, we think this is something we should never allow to happen. Uh, especially if it has a leaky containment. If, if there are situations when you can actually install the package, whether it's design decision or a bug, bugs happen, and then you end up with a package that you installed through Fedora, but nobody actually thinks it's supported and you will get known security uh, holes in it. And nobody will care. Uh, but we acknowledge the technical need for this, for example, for enterprise. 
So, uh, yeah, thanks. This is still technically possible, even in Fedora, uh, with the on-demand site decks. Uh, and it's actually one of the easiest things to do. Uh, you build a dependency in the site deck, you build a dependent package on the site deck, and you untag the dependency from the site deck. The only, of course, problematic part is to prevent the dependency to be accidentally rebuilt in regular Fedora, but we can block things in Cogitex and stuff like that. So you can actually prevent a package to ever be built into, into the regular release. And you can only like, have it be available for the site tags. But as I said, we would like to avoid this at all cost. So another thing that has been, uh, in this case, discussed in Fedora is uh, the removal of the need to have um, uh, change logs and uh, version bumps uh, in spec files. So the reason why uh, this is related is that those, those change logs um, uh, and the, the version bumps which are done manually by the packager are super annoying because when you want to build a specific version of the software in multiple releases, uh, chances are that the only thing that you will need to touch will be the, the version number. Uh, and uh, so there is this busy work of updating the spec file with completely uh, uninteresting things. Um, and uh, uh, the second thing is that if you, if you have few branches which you build for a few releases uh, that are different, but you make changes that are uh, some self-contained change, if you want to cherry pick this, this patch between branches, this would be usually quite easy, but uh, you get conflicts again in the change log and in the, um, in the, 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 the release number. Uh, so if we uh, do what is being discussed, so if we, if we make this, uh, those, those things handled automatically by our tooling, uh, then suddenly it becomes much easier to, to, to take either this, have this case of uh, a single uh, version uh, of, of a package and building it in multiple routes, or uh, maintaining multiple branches uh, that differ, differ a bit, uh, and copying changes between them. So uh, when this is implemented, obviously this um, improves package, packaging for all packagers, uh, because everybody needs to, to do this and it's annoying. Uh, but it also removes some of the, of the push to, to have uh, streams because suddenly we can, we, it's, it becomes much less annoying to take the same thing and build it multiple times. If, if we remove this, 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 uh, 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 th those manual parts that we need to update, uh, as just a, a simple for loop around uh, fed package build target uh, is enough to have a single package build in multiple uh, versions. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and when we talk about building uh, the same thing everywhere, there is two, two variants that need to be considered. Uh, so I will call them build once, ship everywhere. So this is the third one, the first one, uh, where we uh, uh, want to do just a single build and uh, just push it into multiple things. And the second variant is when we take a single source package and uh, rebuild it as many times as, as needed and each uh, uh, target gets a, a, um, a different rebuild. And th those two things kind of seem similar but they, they are quite different. Uh, so the second one uh, is, is already happening, right? I mean, we, for, for many packages, what, what packagers do, they just have a single version that is backwards compatible enough so that they just uh, rebuild it in a loop over all targets and submit a single update that targets all federal releases that are active at any given time. Uh, and the first thing, uh, we, uh, well, so it is possible. We can, we can do it. I think that the Koji policy does not allow non-administrators to do it, but we could, we could allow it, right? We could build uh, a single package and just tag it into 
multiple Koji tags. The reason that we don't want to do this is that to maintain the package, to, to make the uh, binary build compatible with uh, all the releases, it must always be built on the oldest release. So in, this, in the particular case where we would like to have the same package built for Fedora and Apple, we would always have to build packages in Apple and ship them to Fedora. And this means that they must follow the, uh, well, use the lowest common denominator of all features. They must use the old compiler, uh, old libraries, uh, and um, in fact, most likely such a package would even be compatible with our packaging guidelines which require us to use specific uh, build flags. So technically possible, but uh, not wanted. So it might sound interesting to build stuff on Apple 8 right now and ship it in Fedora, but it will be different in 10 years. Uh, and uh, if you look at some packaging guidelines that are applied to Apple 7 packages and what we have in Fedora, uh, you realize it's completely different. And we, we think that like building stuff on Apple to, to ship it on Fedora uh, lacks the uh, first and features foundations and, and we just don't think it's a good idea. But uh, yes, uh, for third parties, for example, this is an excellent thing to offer them. We just don't want to ship Fedora packages this way. Um, so, uh, okay, one, one of the other uh, goals that we identified on the first slide was to make it easy to do chain builds. So uh, we, we have some support for this in, in Fed package, but it's uh, slow and annoying and uh, doesn't work well. And modules do make this much easier. You can have a long list of packages to build uh, in a specific order and uh, the module build system will, will do the right thing. And this is, this is defined in the model uh, ML YAML. Uh, so we have a list of packages, we have some macro overrides, uh, and um, we have the build order. And actually this is pretty much what model YAML is. I mean, all the other metadata is not really interesting. And uh, we uh, covered how uh, we could inject macro overrides into the build route. So here I'm just talking about the, this, uh, the part that is the, the list of packages and the build order. And uh, when we are writing a YAML file, we, we, okay, we need to put the build order there. How, 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 do, how do we define this order? Well, the, uh, for non-trivial cases, we would use some tooling to do this. And this tooling, uh, there was this example of the Rust uh, package a few slides back. It doesn't really matter how, how the Rust tooling figures it out, but uh, it takes the package-specific metadata, does some black magic, and spits out a build order. And, well, okay, we, we put this in the YAM file. Uh, but uh, if we had this kind of tooling, we would also use it for other things. We would use it for master builds, we, we would use it to bootstrap RHEL 9. Uh, we would use it when we build a new version of Golang and we need to rebuild a bunch of, bunch of packages. Uh, right now, those things are either done mostly manually or by brute force and looping uh, builds in a loop. And if we had tooling that understood this, we would have, I mean, this would be generally useful. Um, so version bumps also require builds. So this is all stuff that, that would uh, benefit from, from having this automatized. Uh, and we believe that a build order generation should be uh, as automatic as possible. So we, we, should, we, we, should, we can build, um, and it's not possible in the general case because we have loops, we have uh, uh, things that cause pack builds to fail without being declared in any way. Uh, so a fully automatic solution is certainly not possible, but we can build partial solutions. And, uh, so, and um, so we want to have tooling that does this as far as possible, and then we, um, uh, it is, in various cases, it will be necessary to uh, provide additional information. But this information should not be uh, stored in uh, some separate file that describes a specific build order. This is something that should be part of the package metadata in this git. So uh, 
one of the things that, uh, that I think would uh, help a lot would be to have a, single, a simple file uh, which says uh, what, um, if we fl flip a uh, define, what dependencies are added or removed from the, from the build requires. And this, this is the kind of thing that, it, that happens at the package level. And then this could be fed back into this generator script for the build order to, to, to make, the, make, make the result better. Uh, this can even be also automated in some of the next steps, but you don't have to do that. You could teach some service we already have or create a new service that uh, continuously rebuilds packages with different B count flapped and uh, uh, remembers what, what build requires changed. And then you can query this service and say, okay, I, I, have a, I need to generate a build order, but there is a loop, and let's look what happens uh, if I flip this beacon. And you can get the data from cache uh, while it was there computed by a computer and not you. Uh, so one thing to note is that uh, we are moving towards this model where we have build uh, requires generation at package build time. So we take a, take a, 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 a nice looking S RPM file and we uh, get some list of dependencies but we don't know what this list will be until we try to build the package. And the list will be different in different build routes, right? I mean, for example, uh, the latest Python uh, moves some stuff to the standard library, so suddenly we build a package uh, against Python 3.9 and a certain dependency is gone. There are other cases, of course, where certain dependencies are added and so on. Uh, so taking this, this, this uh, build order um, specification and putting it in, in, in version control in a static file uh, is not useful. There is a question. Uh, okay. Architecture specific build requires make uh, any build order uh, harder, even static, even dynamic. But yes, yeah, so uh, yes, it's, okay, sorry. Uh, the question. Yeah, we'll listen to this at the end, right? Okay, I'll do it now. Uh, the, the question or note was that the uh, architecture specific build requires make it harder for tooling to uh, decide the build order. Because, as I understood it, for example, you run it on your machine and it only considers your architecture and then it blows up in Koji where it builds for all. Is that somehow what you try to say? Uh, well, uh, no, it's just it's more that uh, sometimes you have a dependency that, is, that, only, that only exists on, let's say, S390. And that introduces a new, a new and different uh, <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> it's a very hard problem. Uh, and let me let me give you an example of this. Uh, we do bootstraps of Python packages. Uh, I'm very happy that Python sync their release really cycle with Fedora now, but I am very unhappy that I need to do this more often. Uh, and we have like three three thousand packages uh, in a couple of hundred more every release. Uh, and it's hard. The build order is really hard. And what we try to do is uh, have a YAML, which is not a module, YAML, uh, but it's an RPM list builder, YAML. And it has a list of the initial order and macro overrides that defines the loops and stuff like that. And we have like 500 of packages in there, the initial, and the rest is brute forced because we are lazy. Uh, and we maintain this YAML file and then we adapt it when it fails. And we adapt it when it fails, and we do this every time. And the packages on the list are not maintained by the same people who maintain that file. And it is like trying to build a house over a water. So if I have a module that, I ha that has a static build order, and all the packages in that module are maintained by the same per person who maintains the module, and changes are only ever done together, then making it static is a perfectly valid point. But if we want to make like large scale stacks where actually different maintainers maintain the packages in that stacks, any static order would be out of date the second you push it to Git or maybe a couple minutes later. But 
That's and, the problem. And to answer Stefan's uh, um, <coughs> comment, yes, uh, build specific uh, requires, uh, make the whole thing much harder, but I don't think that this in any way changes the fact that, okay, there are cases where you need to provide additional data to, the, to, to generate a successful build order. Uh, and yes, we, we, we acknowledge that. Um, and uh, we think that this, 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 this um, um, the driving of the uh, of chained builds, it can be done locally. We don't need to have a, a service that does this automatically for us. We can do some. We can combine this local generation and uh, language-specific generation of the build order, uh, and uh, even the the busy loop over uh, packages until they actually do build. Uh, we can do this from a script. We don't need to push it out. And if we achieve a level where, where this is actually working properly, we can always run the script on the server and have this uh, pushed out there. I mean, doing it first remotely and then locally uh, is, um, if we think, the, the wrong way to, wrong way to, 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 to the, attack the problem. Um, you talk, I talk. I can talk, that's fine. So uh, one thing that modularity has is that it expresses dependencies between other modules, like uh, this modular stream of uh, Django needs this, or, or review board needs this modular stream of Django in order to work. And the problem is uh, that you have two levels of, uh, of dependencies, uh, modules on modules, packages on packages, uh, even the packages on packages is qu quite complicated already because it's actually packages on, on virtual provides and virtual provides are provided and sometimes it's a name, sometimes it's something different. And then you have booleans and, and rich dependencies and stuff like that. And on top of that, you have like this group depends on this other group and disables this other group and it makes stuff incredibly complicated. Well, uh, we think that we should just have one uh, set of criteria. Uh, and the way the RPMs were built, like we built these RPMs the fancy new way, and we built these RPMs the, the, the boring old way, uh, shouldn't affect how they interact with each other. It should just use a simple mechanism, and we already have that mechanism that has been battle tested and improved over the last decades. And those are RPM level dependencies, in our opinion. Another thing that goes with this are installation profiles, which are often forgotten when we talk about modularity. Uh, we almost forgot them as well. Uh, in, uh, it has a fancy name, but it's just grouping of binary packages. If you have a different profile, it doesn't mean your MySQL will build a different way. It's still the same package. It just says this profile gets these packages and this profile gets different set of packages. And we already have mechanisms for that, groups and meta packages. Uh, those are some examples of groups that we already have in Fedora, and there are some meta packages that we already have in Fedora. Uh, what we think is better with groups and meta packages is that you can do groups that overlap with each other. While with modular pro installation profiles, a single profile can only install stuff from that module and bring the dependencies from different places. You're shaking your head, so I'm lying. Fine, sorry. Uh, but this is still possible with groups and meta packages. Uh, I'm no longer saying this is better. It's all, it, at least the same, if not better. Sorry about that. So do you, do you like summarize it and let you finally vent? Uh, I see you have a lot of comments. Uh, we think and we believe that the, for Fedora as a project to have a benefits from this, we should not do the things on the left and we should do the things on the right. I hope I did it the right way. Yep. And I'll try to go through this. So if we have the modularity as we have it today, we need custom stuff in DNF to understand the modular dependencies and custom resolving on top of the regular resolving. We need things like Rusa Major or Rusa Prime on stuff like, we need to figure out technical solutions to, to the problems. And it's getting more complicated People say it's workarounds and workarounds, and other people say, no, this is not workarounds. It's not important, but we need to acknowledge that we are, like, keep adding stuff to make stuff works and making it more complex and more complex. We have packages, the shadow packages. We have three branches. 
And unfortunately, we have two classes of packages. And that's obvious from the objective. The objective is to make some packages easier to maintain. And the objective should be make all packages easier to maintain. And for that, we need gradual improvements for everybody, not uh, evolutions in how we ship our content for some content. We need proper tooling, but that can involve gradually. Uh, and we need to focus on the content. Because if we scroll back, we spent six years, I don't know, a lot of years working on this to ship uh, 20 modules with two alternate versions of, of MariaDB. And now I'm, I'm, this is not entirely true. We have some fancy stuff in there. But if we focus on the content that we ship, we could actually have multiple versions of a lot of things. But instead of focusing on the content, we are focusing on how do we fix the delivery mechanism. Uh, the same applies to groups and meta packages. When we were preparing the slides, I realized we have a MongoDB group in Fedora. But there is no MongoDB in Fedora because nobody takes care of the group's definition. But if we have somebody who would like curate the content, and this is something we could get new contributors come in. That was actually one of the purposes of the installation profile, was to put the uh, maintenance of those groups in the hands of people who actually cared about it, as opposed to the comp that actually know is this giant mess. Yeah, I understand it. Okay, the, the current, I will try to summarize that the, the current way we define groups is terrible and putting it, uh, putting it in the hands of the maintainers of the packages that are in the group is an excellent idea and I agree with that. And I, well, also that's why I very much prefer meta packages to groups because uh, they are local. Yeah, and uh, we think that the, uh, we could make DNF uh, handle conflicts and actually like, um, can't, can't resolve situations and errors, easy to understand to users, uh, instead of focusing on enabling, disabling, shadowing, and stuff like that that we don't actually find useful. So if the DNF would tell you, okay, well, you can't install this package because at the end of the dependency chain, the peril it needs conflicts with the peril you have, and in order to proceed, you need to pick one. This is complicated, I realize that. Uh, I see the DNF people being scared. Uh, but uh, you, you need to admit that the stuff that already has been done in DNF to support the modularity we have now is complicated as well. And if I would choose, I would definitely go with the better UX than, than these quirks with, with enabled, disabled, shadowing and stuff. This is, this is our point that we think that we should start focusing on stuff that is useful to everybody instead of focusing on the stuff that's useful to our 20 modules or 30 or 50. Uh, because so far there has been no community buy-in in general, which is sad, but we need to live with that at this point. Yeah. And finally, you can shout on us. Matthew, do you, I need to pass you the mic? Yeah, you need a mic. So you can drop it, right? <laughs> All right, so I have, I guess, a question that I'll phrase as a use case. Um, the, we have the too fast, too slow problem up there as a, uh, as a statement, and one of the things that is tantalizingly frustrating to me all the time is that we actually have for almost all of our packages, too fast and slow packages in source form that are sitting in Git repos. Uh, that is the Fedora RPMs and the CentOS RPMs, and we are working on putting those in the same disk Git, which is, is separate, in, in progress, right? Um, so what I would really like is to make it so that it's very easy to just use those existing streams that we have to ship that software in both places. So, so the use case specifically is, um, I am a CentOS SIG and I work on a specific thing, let's say storage, and I have the, a, a fast version of Gluster that I'm maintaining in Fedora already, and then I'm also maintaining the slow version you know, in RHEL and then in CentOS. So as a CentOS SIG, what they're doing is basically taking the Fedora packages and repackaging them as a CentOS thing. 
it would be nice if instead of doing that, they would just have be reduced to having, I'm maintaining it in Fedora, and it builds into Apple into a, into a version that can be selected, uh, and a, you could maybe even build the CentOS one into Fedora if people want to, for compatibility reasons or whatever, have the older version available in Fedora. With, with modularity, um, you know, give or take some automation, which is theoretically going to happen, um, that should be easy. You define your module once, and then you just do the module build, and then you get those things with, uh, from, from either stream. With this, it sounds like the solution is I now have to create you know, one or two more streams that are the compat packages for each one. So it's not just the creating it. Now I now have maintenance of more streams, which is probably never going to happen, which was... Uh, so yeah, right. uh, I, I think that Mira wants to that talk right? about <laughs> the case of Python backport in Apple. Uh, okay, we need to do this all the time. I will just say in here, uh, I don't need to repeat it right now. There was a mic, so that's fine. Uh, thanks, I, I was afraid I would need to say that all. Uh, so uh, you're correct. Uh, I don't argue with that. But I think it's, we should focus on making the repackaging part, where you take something from CentOS, put in Fedora, or from Fedora to CentOS, or whatever, make it trivial. That's something we can actually do by removing the change logs, putting everything in the same disk git where you can cherry pick from different branches, stuff like that. While creating a general purpose mechanism that allows you to ship packages built or defined in CentOS into Fedora there and back is a very nice goal. But we just think it's just too far uh, to build an entire thing around it. But at the end, it benefits uh, just the person who actually wanted it. And it's so easier to just uh, build the stuff for yourself like, uh, I don't know, you're running CentOS and you want up-to-date uh, systemd and kernel from Rawhide, there you build your own. Because it's easier than trying to develop something that uh, suits everybody. And at the end, it will be like this because you think this package is important to have from CentOS and Fedora, while I think this package is not important because I don't care about it and I think this other package is important. And this is something we need to figure out. What is the content that we want to ship and focus on delivering that instead of designing something that fits everybody and at the end doesn't fit nobody. No, oh, sorry, that was not English. I, I let make you reply first if you want. Okay. All right. Um, before we <clears throat> start devolving into like implementation details and nitty gritty stuff that I am not smart enough to understand. I took this away from your presentation. You restated a lot of the goals that modularity was trying to achieve. You're unhappy with the implementation of it. You have some other ideas that are basically taking those goals and making them general purpose. I don't see anything that conflicts with modularity, so why is this an either or? What, what is stopping you from doing what you're suggesting? So there's two, two parts to this. Um, first is that, uh, in principle, things are, uh, can happen in parallel, but uh, in practice, we have limited manpower. And I think it's pretty clear that when the D DNF team is working on uh, implementing modules, they are not working on implementing better conflict handling. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, uh, there's, uh, I mean, those things can be to, uh, developed uh, as side projects to some extent, but they are not I mean, the, the alternative solutions that we are proposing. The, this will not happen without some larger group working on this. Uh, so yes, this is in some ways about taking the developers' resources that we have and assigning them to work on different things. And we think that, I mean, we are advocating towards some shift. And the second thing is that uh, modularity is coming to Fedora and it is, uh, well, it is not something that just happens on the side, it's something that impacts everyone whether they want it or not. Yeah. 
Um, if I could uh, rebut that just a little bit. Uh, yes, you're right. Resources are very limited, and uh, one thing I tried to express uh, on the mailing list a, couple, a few weeks back, uh, and I'm not sure I did a great job of coming across, was that whether or not it is the ideal situ solution, and I've never claimed that it was. I've claimed that it was the uh, solution we could deliver in the time that uh, the people paying us gave us. Uh, modules have shipped in RHEL. Uh, so no matter what we decide to do in Fedora, finishing that and, and maintaining that is, uh, is something that the Red Hatters, uh, the Red Hatter uh, employee, the Red Hat employees are going to have to do for the next 10 years anyway. And I realize we're in a, that, that, that has backed us into a corner a little bit, but I'm not sure that we, that because, because of that, corporate need, I'm not sure that uh, reassigning resources away from that is going to be plausible. If we want to do, the, if you, I mean, and I don't disagree that all of those things that you're talking about, like, like Josh said, they are co uh, complementary and in many cases would also enable, would also enhance things that we were trying to do in modularity. So I think that they could, should be done, but I'm not sure that we'd be able to pull existing resources off to do them. I understand this concern very much, uh, and I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about internal stuff, so I'll try to be very general in here. Imagine there is a next version of RHEL coming. Sometime. Thank you. So in RHEL 9, we may decide to ship this instead of that. While we still need to support that for the next decade for RHEL 8, we don't have to support it for the next two decades. And there needs to be a certain point where we stop supporting this, or else we will support this for eternity or until there are no more internets or something like that, and zombie apocalypses and stuff like that. And I don't want to have this kind of modularity as it is now uh, forever, because I think it's not like, I. Yeah, I, I can say it. I don't like it, sorry. I just don't. And I, I think uh, we can do better in saying we can't do better because we need to support this is a valid argument. Yeah, I, I definitely didn't do a good job. Okay, so I definitely did not do a good job of expressing what I meant to say, which was this. I believe that this stuff is doable in parallel, that it may benefit both potential approaches, but with resources limited, if we want to do this, we're going to need help. We're gonna need someone to come and bring the patches. I'll give it to Langdon in a second. He talks too much. <laughs> okay, so, within the context of a company, your arguments are correct. Within the context of an open source distribution, which is a community project, they're bogus. If you want to do this, show up and do the work and find people that want to do the work with you. But we cannot be having conversations about resource constraints because that's how open source works, right? You have to have the idea, pursue the idea, and convince people that your idea is better because you're never gonna get somebody that says, oh, I'm gonna spend $20,000 and say, here you go, here's four people for two months, right? Like that, it just doesn't happen that way necessarily. And I totally get the irony of that coming out of my mouth. <laughs> but when you do the work, right, like I, I think there's ways that you can take the existing resources that we have in the community and internally uh, within Red Hat and generalize some of it to make both things better at the same time, that's what I'm saying. I just, I just want to say that if we go with this argument, like uh, we are not changing modularity if you don't show up and give patches, that cornered us totally. We are done. We never change anything and it's over. We can go home. If this is the, the, the argument we want to build stuff on, we might as well decide to never change anything ever again. Why? I'm seriously considering it. <laughs> yeah, it's also a valid, it's, it's a good point. If we don't ever change anything ever again, there's a lot of free time for us. But Langdon really wants to say something. No, I, just, I, just, I don't understand the comments. Like, like, why, why can't we do the work? Can we get, can we get a microphone? Can we <laughs> Sorry, I, my voice is shot. Um, I, just, I just didn't understand the comment. Like, 
why why can't you show up and do the work? Like I'm not I, you know, quibble, I'm not agreeing, disagreeing, or anything else with Josh. I just didn't understand your answer. So there has been a lot of work in modularity that happened uh, on while well, people working at Red Hat being paid on it worked on it. And uh, then if you say this is not correct, we shouldn't do this, we should do this instead, then the argument uh, is let, then let's do it, let's show us how it works. Do you use your uh, free time, you don't need sleep, just, just deliver. Uh, it's just not fair. Oh, it's just, no, I, I guess, okay, so what I was quibbling over, so the group of people you have to convince to let you do patches just happens to be a different group of people, right? Like, like you can still show up and do the work, right? But Red Hat may be paying you to do that, for example, but you have to convince your management chain or whatever to go do that, right? To use your, your work time. I don't think that makes Josh's point invalid. I think what you're saying is just that y you don't see a realistic way to do that as part of your job or as part of your free time. Is that? That's correct. Okay. Sorry, okay. yeah, you're right. So let me, uh, to answer our answer in a slightly different way, the stuff that we are, that we are talking about, like the build root uh, order generation, this is actually something that would also benefit modularity, right? Because right now it's manual and the solution would work, cover both cases. And so we, we, I, I'm saying that we need to work on the tooling anyway. Have you presented these ideas to the people who are maintaining the modules that that exist today, like have they said, if you can do the things you're saying, then I will undo my modules because I don't need them anymore. I can't tell if you're speaking on behalf of people who haven't modularized. I don't know if what you're proposing is something that, that the people who are already invested in modules actually want. So I'm not sure where your motivation springs from. We haven't spoken to all of them. Uh, but we know cases of both. We know cases of people who say, I will ever only maintain this in modules and I don't give a about the normal children packages, and even if it makes things conflict and broken, we, they don't care. And it's very hard to discuss this kind of stuff when their position is so clear. We also know modular maintainers who abandoned all of their modules. Uh, for example, Igor, who was supposed to be here, uh, here with us. He, he maintained a lot of modules in Fedora, all the Rust modules, uh, even uh, DNF in module, uh, to have dynamic build requires on all the releases and stuff like that. And he just decided that it's not going anywhere and wants to change it uh, the way we do. Uh, there are always people in both camps. This has been very, uh, that, uh, like, splitting the, the Fedora community over the past years. Either you are pro or you are against. Obviously, there are a lot of people who don't care that much, but you don't hear them saying stuff that often. I will not pick people to give questions because I'm probably biased in the middle area, so please <laughs> you do it. Well, um, at the present time we have about uh, 50 modules in the Fedora, something like that. And uh, I think uh, that's quite easy to ask, uh, well, 50 teams, 50 members, yeah, even less, because some of the people uh, maintain multiple modules. Why? Why do they create the modules and what they expect? Because I believe that in the list, uh, what was uh, mentioned, what was uh, the main purpose of the modularity? Yeah, there are much different, purpose, uh, much different reasons that we thought. We always think that uh, we try to resolve the user cases, but we provide a tooling. And usually people take a tooling and uh, use them by their needs. And they are qu quite often different. And also, we have to think about another part of the people. I mean, the end users. End users are, well, very limited uh, represented in this discussion because they are simply not going to attend any developer conference. But uh, we have to think how they want uh, to consume the modules. And this is why we are here. Yeah, we are, the good, uh, we are providing world better for the end users, not for us. That's our primary goal. Secondary goal is to provide a better world for us. Thank you. Well, I, I, I think that all you said is true, um, especially the part about users. So yeah, we believe that uh, that's why we want to concentrate on the content, not on the delivery mechanism and making things more complicated. And uh, yes, we, we didn't talk to every module maintainer, but actually if you look at this list, uh, the first part, the first two classes, 
they are essentially trivial. I mean, there are, there are toy things that making things modular or not doesn't really change anything. And if you look at the two uh, last okay. classes. I have That's not true. Okay. I don't agree. No. Well, we, we see some change, but we, we uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we see the data and we suggest the reasons. Well, sometimes the reasons are different as well, what we see. We don't see the long-term uh, long, uh, plans of the teams that present uh, this stuff. Or we uh, probably, yeah, that was the, uh, sometimes the reason could be, uh, well, that's new, let's do it because it's cool stuff. But we never know, yeah? We only suggest, well, let's ask them. So uh, a lot of modular maintainers uh, gave us a, like a very general answer. And the answer was, uh, I choose to maintain my stuff in modules because it's easier for me. Uh, we didn't dig deeper yet, like why exactly, what are the features, and we should definitely do that. I agree with that. Uh, but the point is, we fundamentally disagree with a goal that makes certain packages easier to maintain. This is a wrong goal, it's an unfair goal. And the goal should be make all packages easier to maintain. I think this should be the spirit of Fedora, uh, not like having two classes of packages. And uh, like to be honest, when we created the slides, there was a typo that we considered funny but also true, and we accidentally typed two classes of packages. And we d decided not to keep that, but uh, this is what I see, I feel happens. So just to answer that one part, like, <clears throat> What about, <clears throat> sorry, what about uh, anything related to modularity indicates, like none of your evidence as far as I can tell, nothing that you've commented on indicates in any way that the people involved in modularity would not like everything to be modules, A, B, that everything be maintained in the same way, and then C, be as automated as possible. Like, like nothing about the intent to have two classes of packagers or packages or anything else is in any of your evidence, as far as I can tell. And you're putting a lot of assumption on us that is frankly completely invalid and kind of insulting. I had never the intention to insult any of the people who work on this. And I am very sorry every time I hear this argument. I try to make my points valid. I try to make my points technical. I know we could get biased. I admitted that I don't like the modularity thing because I don't think I should lie about that. But it doesn't mean I uh, disrespect your work or any other people. And I mean this sincerely. I'm not just saying it because I need to say it or something like that. Okay. Because the goal. So that's an intermediate goal. That, or that's one of the. Uh, you, you need a mic. Okay. Uh, this is from an objective that was one of the phases here, and so this was. Uh, I, I don't remember the steps here, but but the idea was originally that everything would be modularized, but this was a step along the way of we we're going to add a modular repository on top as a way of of getting to getting to that goal. It isn't that the goal here isn't to have. Um, uh, a separate classes of packages. And I think also one of the other things about modularity is that it actually leaves the packages alone and adds a metadata on top of it so the packages themselves stay the same. There's no such thing as a modular okay. package, right? So, a, so why, well, I mean, there are two classes because effectively when stuff is modularized, it becomes much harder for the non-modular stuff to, to consume that. I mean, we, we were talking about Ursa Major and some ways to solve this, but effectively the current state is that modularization of stuff makes it harder or different. A, yeah, that's not a goal. <laughs> it, well, okay, it's not a goal, yes. Yes, and it's, it's just how, how things happen to be currently. And uh, sorry, I wanted to say one thing uh, before. If we look at the list of modules that we currently have, uh, there are, I mean, it, it is clear that there is a few use cases that are being done. I mean, this is, this is all in a single YAM file, and you look at this file and you see what is happening there. You know, people might have some, some vague plans for the future, but what is being done not right now is either simple, relatively simple rebuilds of, of packages uh, with possibly with some macros defined, 
or the two, two cases where you have a, a, a tree stack that goes one way up with a single package at the, at the top, or the other version inverted when you have a single package at the bottom and a bunch of packages built on top. Right? I mean, we, we look at the, at the model YAM and we see that. There's not that much complication there. One thing about modularizing everything and then making everything better by doing this, which is uh, probably a nice idea, uh, especially from people who, who like modularity, uh, we can't ever achieve that without community buy-in. And we should work on that. And maybe after this much time, we should acknowledge that uh, it's not happening unless we fundamentally change either how things are done or what things are done. If we keep doing the things how we are doing it now, and if we, if we keep doing the things we are doing now, the community buy-in will not just appear from a thin air. And uh, yeah, on the left side and right side are also other people. We should be inclusive about this. Hi, guys. So just, just a couple of comments. Like, I think everybody agrees with your general premise of trying to make packaging easier. It is really strange to see this presentation and how you've somehow tied that energy to stopping modularity for some reason. I, I kind of missed that part. Um, but I will say, like, community buy-in also, I think, I think that's a definite problem. Um, I, I, I guess I'm confused as to what this presentation did to help that problem. I, to get community buy-in, I mean. Because it, it seems like you're just feeling the fire. And I say that with a little bit of extra just reminding everybody in the room that certainly by now all of us understand that it's not enough to be right. I'm not saying you're right. I'm not saying modularity is right. But this hasn't moved the ball at all. And for some reason, I'm still seeing the stopping energy going into modularity, and I'm confused why. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, why stop energy? Let's, let's consider a, a different project that is happening right now, Packet. So I have my opinions about uh, the way that Packet uh, approaches the, the, the problem of tying upstream to, to Fedora. And I might, you know, I might like it, I might not like it, but it doesn't really matter because Packet is a clean addition on top of Fedora. And if there is buy-in, good. If there is not, I'm also happy. Uh, but in this particular case, this changes how Fedora is developed. It is not transparent to anyone. It change, I mean, it impacts everything. So I get that it wasn't if, transparent if we, to if you we, guys. If we are talking but... about a solution that we think doesn't work, then I mean, you have, you have to make a choice. Either we implement it and we buy in into it, or not. Where, where was the, I mean, where do you want disruptive changes to happen? Mm. Well, I'm saying that those particular disruptive changes, I don't want to happen. And so you've decided to get up in front of this group, spend 90 minutes convincing us all that we should stop it. Well, this, this has been discussed on Fedora Devo for I don't know, the last two years, maybe 100 messages uh, every month. So, and... Good luck, guys. We are sincerely convinced that the stuff that we think should we, fo we should focus on would get the community buy-in. We might be wrong. Go get it. I, I think it also would be, uh, also in, in fairness, I think we should point out that some of the reason the community buy-in is, uh, is not happening is that some of the enablers uh, we haven't been able to put in place, and partly that's because of the discussion over the issue of disruption that Mike's, that Mike's talking about. So, you know, when we're hospitable to letting that disruption take place, or, or at least trying things, and then again, failing fast and then trying to recover as opposed to stopping change. I, I think that we, we end up in a better place overall. Finding out that something doesn't work quickly and then reversing course is better than having to kind of really fight a lot of headwind uh, in order to get there because it, it basically the progress slows down as opposed to you know, finding that your path was wrong and then, and then changing it. So again, I'm not trying to make a value judgment on which approach is right. I'm just saying we, we probably could get through the process faster um, approaching it differently. And Adam Williamson over there had his, I know Brendan, you had your hand up too, but that side of the room hasn't got a chance yet. 
so just a quick comment. Uh, it's not that this is, uh, you know, it's not 2016 right now, and this is not the alpha version that we, we are saying that the alpha version is bad. This, this uh, solution and the alternatives that we are proposing is something that has been uh, hashed and rehashed in various ways over the last four years. So, uh, yeah, I mean, when you say that we need to be able to iterate fast and fall back if things don't work, this also applies to modularity. Uh, we work on the alternatives, yes. Okay, I f I f just to try and bring a little bit of sweetness and light, I think everything went off the rails at that exact point. It's like, I see there's kind of two things you've done in this presentation. You've pointed up some legitimate shortcomings in the current modularity. I think everyone said they agree with that. And my perception has been that the modularity team is pretty open and willing to acknowledge shortcomings and discuss them, and when it's agreed that there's a problem, they will try and improve it. And I think it's definitely an uncontroversial, valuable thing to point up, hey, maybe we need to think about build root only packages in a Fedora context, just as an example. Maybe we can come to a way to change that kind of thing. You've also said that on a broader scale, you think modularity is the wrong design, and you'd like to try something else. And People have been generally open to doing that, but w the problem was when you kind of implied that you think Red Hat ought to pay you to work on the alternative, which, well, that's kind of what you said. They said, well, go away and, and bring the work, do the work, bring it to Fedora and like show it off, like get the buy-in. And you said, well, we don't have time to do that on work times. So effectively you're saying we should be able to use our work time to work on this. And that's saying that Red Hat should, should imme not immediately, Red Hat should give you space to work on this alternative. And the problem with that is, really? I thought we had another half an hour. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I just think that's the thing that we need to resolve, right? It's like that so, nexus. So, okay, so let's step back a bit. This, uh, those things, they're, uh, I mean, they're, those are big things. Those are not things that anyone can solve uh, on their own, right? And in a way, this discussion uh, that we are having is something that, uh, well, yes, we are trying to convince people to go for a different set of solutions than uh, the other set of solutions. We, we are out of time.